Senator Eric Tarr. He is the Senate Finance Chairman out of Putnam County. Eric, good morning to you. Thank you so much for joining us today. Good morning, John. How are you doing? Excellent. Thank you. And uh, oh, that's Rob. Sorry. Yeah, that's Sorry okay. That. Yeah, <laughs> can get your all's voices right here on the scene. Uh, I I usher at the uh, the church I go to, and uh, one of the ushers calls me Mike, and another one calls me John. You ought to be in my seat. He was good. Mike would be good, eh? <laughs> hey, Mike, yeah, I'll take Mike. I'll take Mike pretty quick. Mike or John. So I, so I answer to anything that anybody calls me all the time, so it's all, it's all good. Uh, Senator Tarr, first and foremost, I want to uh, get into the finance numbers. The first two months of the year have been relatively flat. Is that concerning to you in any way? It is. You know, it's, um, it's, uh, the, it follows a trend that um, we kind of – forecasted what concerns me is the the governor's push to reduce our revenues in spite of seeing um they are forecast bearing you know can be coming true so the first couple months of the the year here we see that we are running flat we've got uh, corporate nets down about 13 percent this month um our sales tax collections um that come in they're about two percent so they're actually not keeping up with the inflationary rate and then our pit is about where it's on forecast is fairly flat as well um, so we're right now, relative to estimates, we're a couple hundred thousand dollars below the governor's estimates um, for the year. And normally, we're used to having some suppressed revenue estimates, and you'll see that you know, there's the surplus that's been extraordinary over the past couple of years um, relative to the suppressed estimates. So what really gives me concern is that if these estimates are also suppressed and we're below estimates, then we, we really need to make sure we're, we're being – uh, prudent with our spending and with uh, any kind of things we do to affect revenue. The trigger of 4% does not concern you, however, correct? No, that I mean, that, that's that's forecasted in there. And then the trigger itself um, is relative to economic growth. And so if this past year we have outpaced inflationary growth. And so when our revenue coming into the state off of our general revenue collections, which primarily – comes in this that affects this trigger primarily comes off of the personal income tax itself your sales tax collections and then your corporate net uh, taxes corporate net income taxes and there's a very there's sundry of others but those make up the lion's share of it so when those three uh, with those other sundry of taxes that come in that outpace um, inflationary growth then we, that gets returned back to the people for a, a tax reduction on income taxes and so they, it's designed to to reward uh, people for putting office people in office who are going to be uh, judicious with their spending, and um, it's, uh, it's it's working like it should. So yeah, I'm I'm eager to see the 88 million dollar tax reduction. Actually, it might even be a little bit more than that. Um, in addition to what we've done to eliminate the in t the income tax on Social Security, that phases out over the next couple of years as well, and starts in, with this coming year. In, in regards to future obligations that the state has to meet. Do those future obligations grow in size to the point that an additional 5% income tax cut that the governor is asking for would create a financial obligation that the state will have trouble meeting? I believe so. Um, and, that's, and that's one of the things we've, we've said to the governor is that, you know, if you're, going to, if you're going to present an income tax cut that would, could be considered by the legislature with any kind of seriousness, is that it's going to be, have to be, be met with reductions in spending that accommodate it. And the reason I say that, if you go back a couple years, um, two years ago, we had a $1.8 billion surplus. And um, the following year, which is this past year, we've had uh, about a $589 million surplus. So you, you go through, it's a $1.2 billion decrease in your revenue that's available after your spending. Um, and then this, this coming year, and it's already flat, um, surpluses are probably going to be somewhere in the neighborhood of two to three hundred million, and so and that's with what we have now. So the trend on um, where we are as a surplus situation relative to our budget is getting closer and closer and closer. And we knew that would, and that, and it should, because you need to return those tax dollars to the people of West Virginia. And we've been holding, you know, for four years we held flat budgets, which was a really big deal. Um, your guys, uh, senators, you sent down here, Senator Blair. It's, his brainchild, and it's, it's, it's really made possible the ability to go in and initiate this tax cut. Um, but then beyond that, if 
we have, if you look out for 26 and 27 um, fiscal years, there are statutory obligated spends that we have on the books that exceed $600 million. And in addition to that, we expect in this special session the governor's going to have probably another 25 to 30 million on there that increase our base spends going forward. So, you know, it's the math just doesn't work out if you come in and reduce it another 110, 115 million dollars of of your of your revenue every year while you're increasing your spends well over 600 million dollars. And you're seeing that you only got a two hundred million dollar cushion. So, so yeah, it's. I mean, it, you got to get to where you're paying attention really, really close here over the next couple of years. Uh, we have economic growth uh, that we have forecast ahead of us, but it takes a while for those businesses to get built up out of the ground and start having that revenue circulate in the West Virginia economy uh, that allows for that growth to start trending back up the other way. Is the state still obligated to contribute fifty percent of any surpluses into the rainy day funds? Yes. Yeah, we still have it's, – it's capped, though. So once it gets up to where um, we're at, I believe it's 20 percent of our, our previous year's budget, then uh, then it's – you don't have to do that. So it's – and that's about where we are now. Our rainy day fund is very healthy. So um, we've got – and I just received word yesterday that the loan that the, we take out every year, we take out a loan um, from the rainy day fund to pay for the first month's expenses because the state starts at zero every fiscal year. So just imagine your your personal account going to zero, but your bills are the same. So um, that's the way the, the it works in state government. And so we took about a seventy-eight million dollar loan, I think it was, from um, uh, the personal or from the rainy day fund. And so that was paid back, I believe, yesterday. Um, the governor's office, against uh, some really uh, consternation from the legislature, also took. Uh, was paying back personal income tax returns from the personal income tax reserve fund, which is very rare to do that. Um, They paid those funds back into the personal income tax reserve fund yesterday as well, I was told. So we're we're, um, back now working off of current tax revenues that come into the state to pay for the services of government, and it's running pretty flat. Like I say, we're about 200,000 below estimates. The state, because of some pension obligations that weren't being met a few years back, has been kicking in some extra money each year to keep the pensions solvent and eventually reach uh, the point where they are, I guess, close to 100 percent. Do any of those spends reduce or come off the books in the next few years? Uh, they do uh, after 2030. So it's, uh, we'll probably see, I think it's somewhere between 2032 and 2035. Um, that uh, from the last uh, report that we had that we expect to be 100% funded at our pension plans with our current discount rate. Um, so, and that's and uh, that's remarkable. You know, for if you look at our pensions nationwide, West Virginia is in top five in the country for how well funded our pension plans are. So, um, and that that is stability in government our rainy day fund uh we're in top 10 in the nation i can't remember exactly where we rated actually we have had on a report here but it's up pretty high as well um as far as a percentage of our budget um so that shows stability um we've put a a reserve fund out there for the income tax in case there's in case something unexpected comes up and so um we we have and to use the governor's words we have definitely minded the store in the legislature um, so I, I feel confident that as long as we stick to the plan that we started out with uh, back in uh, really in 2015, we're trying to figure out how to how to get the budget corrected. If we stick to that plan um, as we have been. I think you're going to see that the uh, ability to reduce taxes will accelerate in the future, and I think that our ability to meet um, the the moral obligations of the state I think will be um, more secure because of that economic growth. So um, I'm, I'm bullish on it, but at the same time, you still, you, you know, you, you, if you get ahead of your skis on it, you could really crash it all. Mr. Gilstrap. Just to be clear, <clears throat> going back to that $600 million delta, one point uh, in the surplus, the 1.2 down to $600 million, how much of that was just expiration of federal COVID money? So we, we haven't budgeted with, with COVID money. Um, what we have done, though, is we've used state dollars to go in and pull down federal dollars that then circulates in the economy. 
So um, the actual revenue that came in for that 1.8 billion is not general re- or is, is not federal money. That's that was that was general revenue. And when we held the four flat budgets, every year we did that, that created about 150 million dollars. So you had about 600 million of that 1.8 billion that came in was from holding flat budgets. And then in addition to that, West Virginia went through some some really good economic times um, with our surpluses and severance taxes. Um, and to give you an example, I mean, just this fiscal year compared to last year, our severance taxes are down about 37%. So we had record high gas prices, record high coal prices for a while um, that, that additionally drove that up. And in addition to all that, then you had the federal funds. And so the federal fund side of it is West Virginia really has received for the past uh, about four years um, about $9 billion more per year in federal funds than we typically do. And what we typically see is, uh, to give you an example, this year's this year's budget or revenue estimates um, are right about around $5.2 billion in general revenue. But we'll run a $20 billion budget. So about $15 billion of that is, is normal federal funds. Um, the past four years, we've had an extraordinary $9 billion come into the state off of per year off those federal funds like you know, the Infrastructure um, Act and, and the, the ARPA and all those things that came through. And what we've done with those, those surplus dollars, we did not grow our spends with – the extraordinary growth that West Virginia had, what we did on a, on a base level. But we did do a lot of one-time spends. And the one-time spends we did, we would spend money on things that would either reduce the future tax obligations of the people of West Virginia for having spent it, either by bringing revenue in or by reducing liabilities that stood out ahead of us. And the way you bring revenue in is economic growth. And so, um, you know, we went in and put uh, used a bit of that uh, six hundred million dollars into our economic development fund, and once, you know, we landed some really big employers into West Virginia that were Fortune 100 companies. And for having done that, it was like sending the bat signal up over West Virginia. All those vendors come with them. Other Fortune 100s are looking, and, and it's a uh, almost every day. Um, and to say every day would be an exaggeration, but it's frequently per week in there that we are meeting with major, major companies in the Senate President's conference room, and they're looking at West Virginia letting us know they're looking. So it's it's uh, it's promising for the future. Matt Miller. Eric, when you look at the triggers that were set into place with the legislation to say if we reach certain marks, then this amount will come off as we continue to dwindle away the income tax in West Virginia. Is it too early? I mean, when the governor comes out and says, I want an additional 5%, why you know, don't don't we don't we have a piece of legislation that is supposed to make sure that this is done in a, a safe and 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 positive manner absolutely yeah and that's what I, I don't see the urgency in this so regardless of when if you were to do an additional income tax cut this year first of all it wouldn't come into effect in january so i didn't i don't see what the fire was to step into september to do an extraordinary special session um that's one. Two is that to do it before we have this next gubernatorial administration step in and potentially cut their knees out is, you know, why, why do you take that risk? You, you're going to wait and see what their, what their gubernatorial agenda is going to be. And if you go in and essentially have to go in and do major cuts for having done income tax cuts too aggressive after we've held all this flat spending and after we've controlled spending, after we've reduced the size of these agencies, um, then I, I, don't see, I don't see the urgency there. When you have a law in place that aggressively reduces your income tax for any time you have economic growth above the inflationary rate. And so, I mean, it already triggered. This trigger coming in is another $88 million at least. And then in addition to that, we have the first $10 million of, that comes off the, the uh, Social Security income tax in addition to that 4%. So we're going to have at least a $98 million income tax cut that comes in this year already before you would ever consider the governor's additional 5%, which the Revenue Department told me this week would be another $115 million. 
So, um, yeah, I'm 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 extremely cautious. I think that it's um, it, it could be very irresponsible giving the known spins we have ahead of us. So, Senator, extrapolating out on that, when you look at assuming that the results of the primaries become the results of the general election, and assuming that that the the representatives from this area reflect with the rest of the state, there's a big push for the total elimination of the personal income tax that's coming toward Charleston in the next session. Yeah, you know, and, and there's, there's, I'll tell you, you're going to be hard-pressed to find anybody who wants to eliminate the personal income tax than the Senate. And we've, we've proven that because we've ran a couple pieces of legislation over a couple years to knock out half the income tax in one foul swoop and then trigger down the rest of it. Um, if the year before last, we, we ran that legislation, passed it out of the Senate, um, that what the way you get there, and because you're talking about eliminating just about two and a half billion dollars of revenue, it's about it's um, about 40 percent um, that makes up our total revenue that comes in on general. And so, to get there, you're talking about eliminating um, about 1.2 to 1.25 billion dollars revenue out of a $5.2 billion budget. We're starting to lose your cell a little bit, Eric. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, you're a little, about that. You're a little, little clouded there. Okay, yeah, we got a storm down here in my area of West Virginia, so that might be affecting signals some. Yeah, that, that may be it there. Um, uh, uh, hey, you're good there. Wherever you're standing, don't okay. move. Yeah, that, that's okay. perfect. All right, I'll hold right here. Don't put that other foot down. <laughs> <laughs> All right, there you go. That's right. Um so the uh, um, the we have to, uh, to get to a, a full elimination will take time, and it'll take a very responsible governor, a very responsible legislature to do it. Um, where we where we sit n- now is that it will gradually get there over time without having to raise any other taxes. Now, when it matters, is that fifty percent? When West Virginia gets our, our our income tax rates down to about 50% of where we started in 2019, you become nationally competitive with our income tax rate. And that becomes important because when you become nationally competitive, we know that, that feet follow that income tax reduction. The only way you can responsibly get there now is either really, really deep cuts in addition to what we've already done or – swap it out with another revenue source, which would most likely be your sales tax. And so those, and the, the House has, has you know, made a very strong statement. They're not willing to go in and do the revenue swap, at least in past legislatures, because the last time we passed that out of the Senate, the House voted it down 100 to nothing. So we went back to the drawing board and said, okay, how do we get this thing down over time without going in and raising a sales tax? And that's the bill we produced. And it is as aggressive as you can get without being irresponsible. But can you also fix the school problem while doing that at the same time? The school problem. So you want to be more specific on which school problem we're talking about? Well, more to the point, right? Uh, we've got a lot of them. There, there's the, the test scores, the lack of teachers because we can't pay the teachers enough. There's the discipline problems. There's the attendance problem. There's we don't have enough bus drivers. You know, it, it, it goes across the board. Uh-huh. Truancy is, is rampant across all the school districts. Yeah, so here's – so, yeah, there's um, – um, the more we can go in, especially up in your your all's area of the state, in the eastern panhandle, um, and it's down here too where I live, but I think you guys are seeing it uh, more impact because of where you sit next to Maryland and Virginia so closely – to be competitive with salaries in your market is very different than being competitive with salaries in, say, Mingo County. Um, so you guys are really filling that up there. So what does it take to be able to adjust for those those salaries? Really what that takes is going back and addressing the personal property tax more so than anything else and probably addressing the school aid funding formula. And the, this, the current funding formula we have now was developed by a federal court in the 1980s. And so I'm not so sure that it's reflective of today's education economy. Um, but when we went through and tried to pass um, Amendment 4, or excuse me, Amendment 2 um, in this past election, and um, 
the state voted it down. But what that did is that gave the legislature the ability to go in and reduce personal property taxes and replace that with general revenue. And the legislation that, that would have followed that, um, that legislation put about another $90 million a year in the counties to do with as they, as they see fit. $90 million more than they build, not what they collected. $90 million more than what they build in taxes. So that, that did two things. One is it gave a lot more money to address schools, uh, police, fire, and all those things in the county had we done that. The other thing that it did is that one of the other taxes that West Virginia is really not competitive with is our personal property tax. We are higher than all of our border states with the personal property tax, and so if you're a business who has any kind of inventory, whether it's robotics, whether it's automobiles, whether it's uh, retail goods or whatever, or parts to build something with, it's cheaper in tax situation to have that company sitting across the river than it is in West Virginia when you consider personal property taxes, which means we have to get real creative in other places to offset that revenue. So Amendment 2 would have done two things, is it would have made us – got us to a point where we could be competitive with our personal property tax, which is where the one places that we're an outlier, and it put more money into county coffers for however they would use it. So one of the things I think we should do is I think once we get to that 50 percent income tax reduction, which will be extremely competitive, we need to take another look going back and say, OK, can we slow things down and redirect toward personal property tax again? Or should we? I, I think it, it's it'll um, there's merit to reconsidering that at that time. Senator Eric Tarr has been our guest here on the program. About a minute left, Eric. Uh, what is the the uh, PEIA obligation for the state for this upcoming year, and how much does it grow in the coming years? So um, there's a couple things that are that uh, PEIA that we have to pay attention to. One is that um, when we switched to 8020, um, it left a reserve fund that set um, that legislation left essentially a locked up fund within the state budget of about 80 million dollars that that was a reserve fund. And at the same uh, – very shortly after that, the federal government put the entire country into a crisis over the FAFSA forms for, um, for our universities. And FAFSA is what um, our students fill out for federal aid and for state aid for when they're going to go to school. And so what uh, the uh, governor and legislature did is we went in and we took that $80 million that kind of got locked up and put that into um, a fund that would – allow students to have access to the same kind of money they would had they not been able to get the FAFSA done. And that really saved a lot of students um, uh, being able to go into school and also um, saved a lot of our universities. <clears throat> Excuse me. Saved a lot of our universities. The, um, so that, that fund, though, is when you, when you go in and you um, – have any company insurance you still have to have a reserve fund that if you have extraordinary claims come in so we got to go back in and fix that fund and refund and put money back in that eric will you be addressing we, that september 30th we will i believe we will and that's about 80 million dollars right. and i think that you're probably going to see a growth in pia just as we do every year probably in the neighborhood of 40 to 60 million. i gotta jump in here because we're in a hard out i gotta get rolling thanks so much for your time and i hope that storm doesn't bother you too much no oh, thanks for having me on Senate Finance Chairman Eric Tarr.